Calling all detectives. When I got interested in a suit on a clothing store dummy, I discovered that a wax model had turned human, but was just as dead as wax. That is the situation on this page for my casebook, the casebook of Jerry Browning, private detective. Even a private detective like me, Jerry Browning, never can tell when people will suddenly think they're suited to crime. I was walking down Grover Street past the windows of John Locke, Outfitters to Gentlemen. I looked at the suits on display and at the old serge job I was wearing and went inside. All the salesmen seemed to be busy at the moment, so I looked around, wandered past rack after rack of suits. I was so engrossed that I tripped over the feet of a smooth character seated on a bench. (laughs) Smooth was right. It was a wax dummy. I studied the soft brown cashmere suit it was wearing, tried to visualize myself in the same number. And as I bent down to see the price tag, $85, I heard a discreet voice. I'm Mr. Randolph. May I help you? Yeah, I'd like a suit. The salesman showed me a number of suits and tried very hard to sell me a well-tailored banker's gray flannel. Most becoming. Uh, Let me call out to Mr. Dwyer and have him take a look at it. I shook my head. No, thanks. I don't care for it. How about that $85 cashmere on the dummy? I saw your fitter take it upstairs just a couple of minutes ago. I'm sure it hasn't been sold, sir. I'll go right up and get it for you. I won't be a moment. It took almost five minutes. I was about to leave the store when the salesman came dashing back. Sir, something dreadful has happened. I found the suit and the dummy hidden behind one of the layaway racks in the workshop. Only the figure is now that of our president, Mr. Locke. And he's been murdered, stabbed to death. I sent a salesman to get me the suit a wax model was wearing and learned that the body of the store owner had been substituted for the dummy. Lieutenant Dawson and his homicide squad got there fast. Good work, Jerry. Keeping the customers from leaving. Okay, man, get to work. First, the cops got the names and addresses of the customers. All right, folks, you can leave now. But you may be wanted for questioning. Now, there's nothing to worry about, and I know you all want to cooperate. So see to it that you're available. Don't leave town. The customers filed out. Then the doors were locked, and the cops went to work in earnest. Dawson and I sat down at the credit manager's desk, sifting the yield of their investigations. They found the real dummy in the stockroom, but Locke's own suit was a little harder to locate. It finally turned up neatly packed in a box in the will call office, also a part of the workroom. Jerry, the murder was somebody who had complete freedom of the joint. Only an employee could have done it. I agreed with Dawson. But which employee? There were 43 people on the John Locke staff. Got up from the desk to get a list of their names from one of the cops who was interviewing them, one by one. When I came back, I found another man at the desk with Dawson. Jerry, this is Tom Lowell, the credit manager. We've kind of moved in on him. He's already been interviewed, and now if it's okay with us, he'd like to do a little work. Just let me get a few things from my desk and I'll clear out of your way. Maybe I shouldn't go on working at a time like this, but I think that's how Mr. Locke would want it. He was a great one for business as usual. Now, I call that a commendable attitude, Mr. Lowell. You just sit down here and go on about your business. You won't bother Mr. Browning and me, and we'll try not to get in your way. Go ahead, sit down. Lowell looked a little startled, then grateful. He sat down and went to work on a flock of credit application forms. Dawson turned away to consult a sheet of scribbled notes. Here's a medical examiner's report, Jerry. I flashed a warning look at Dawson, but I needn't have worried about discussing the case in front of one of the suspects. Tom Lowell was lost in the world of signatures and bank references. Just then, a cop came up to the desk. Here you are, Luton. If this isn't the murder weapon, I'll eat me badge. He held out a long, glittering pair of shears, the kind tailors use. I found them hidden behind a rack in the tailor's workroom. Dawson nodded grimly. We'll cut through a lot of red tape with these shears. They practically identify the criminal. Jerry, what's the name of the man who does a fitting and altering for this joint? Dwyer. I looked at the list of employees still in my hand. Wilfred Dwyer, age 52, married, three children, been with the firm 14 years. Salary as fitter, 100 and a quarter a week. That's pretty big money for Taylor. Let's get him over here. Maybe he'll sew himself up.
Wilfred Dwyer was a terrified little man. I, I hope you don't think I had anything to do with this, this terrible thing. Why, Mr. Luck was my friend. Lowell looked up from his papers. Huh. Since when does a friend threaten to fire another friend for insubordination? Ask Dwyer about that, Mr. Browning. There was a scuffle, but Dwyer was no match for Big Tom Lowell. In fact, Lowell didn't even make much of an attempt to defend himself. He just held the little guy off. See what I mean, Browning? And this attack shows he's guilty, if you ask me. Well, no one was asking Lowell. But Dwyer, wise to how things were going, decided to do a lot of talking. Fast. Mr. Locke and I did disagree several times. You see, I was all for progress, doing things the new way, by machine, and instead of the old expensive way of altering everything by hand. But Mr. Locke wouldn't hear of it. That's when he suggested that if I couldn't continue to work according to the Locke tradition, it would be better for me to leave. But we straightened out the whole thing like sensible people and remained good friends. To think that I would murder... The thought was too much for Dwyer. He slumped, staggered against the desk, and would have fallen if he hadn't grabbed at a drawer pull. The drawer yanked open, and in that same second, Tom Lowell went into action, swarming all over Dwyer. This time, he didn't spare the little tailor. While Dawson yanked him away, I was busy poking into that open drawer. Dawson, you'd better get that cop who offered to eat his badge if the shears weren't the murder weapon. See this spindle for holding credit forms? It has blood stains on it. This is the real murder weapon, and Tom Lowell is the killer. We took Lowell to headquarters, where he finally confessed, when he learned that his credit accounts were being gone over. Yep, yeah, he'd been falsifying the accounts, putting payments into his own pocket. When Locke got suspicious and threatened to have an audit, the credit man struck at him with the nearest handy weapon, a spindle. He wanted Dwyer to take the blame, so he had to fake a different murder weapon, the shears a tailor would use in a similar situation. Lowell saw the fitter handle the dummy... Got the idea of throwing further blame on Dwyer by working the weird change of costume between the dummy and the dead man. Like I said, any time a man thinks he can murder his long suit, what he usually winds up with is a rope necktie.